production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckheads join me shortly in our topics this week. Krauthammer hammers Trump critics and Trump. The city council trying to hammer out details of a bond issue. And the Kansas governor is not yet bonding with the new legislature. Plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about the economy in Kansas City and nationwide as the Trump administration comes to power. The 45th president says his administration will cut taxes for individuals and corporations, reduce regulations, and bring jobs back to America from abroad. Since Trump's election, the stock market has soared and consumer confidence has reached levels not seen for a decade. To give us a realistic look at what to expect, we're pleased to welcome back economist Dr. Chris Keel, a managing partner at Armada Corporate Intelligence in Kansas City. Chris, thanks for coming in. It's great to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Let's start in Kansas City. From an economic perspective, what does 2017 look like? I think it's going to be pretty good. The Kansas City economy started to show some signs of growth in 2016, and that's going to be one of the stories throughout this year, is that a lot of what we're seeing now began six months, nine Nine months, 10 months ago, and that same trend is carrying through into 2017. Our unemployment is lower than the national norm. We're seeing growth in areas that we haven't seen growth for a while. The auto sector is improving almost by the month. I think we're in for a pretty good year. It's not going to be the sort of thing that sets hearts afire. It's not going to be 4 or 5% growth, but I think we'll be probably a little above the national average when it comes to GDP growth around here. What about the streetcar downtown? Some enthusiasts believe that is an economic engine for the area. Do you think it's all that important? Well, it's important if it continues to grow. Uh, the trick you with... mean expand? Yeah, it has to continue to expand. It has to go different places. It has to link the city more effectively. Every streetcar program that's been tried in the last 20, 25 years has had a master plan. And at some point, it becomes a kind of a web that unifies the entire city. Those cities that have not been able to expand fast enough have seen sort of a burst of enthusiasm, and then it fizzles. A lot Denver's, of talk about a downtown convention right. hotel, 800 rooms. I guess it's still being planned. Mm -hmm. Would its arrival make a significant difference downtown? It is getting very close to the point that large conventions can consider Kansas City, and that's the critical thing. If you can get enough hotel space that big conventions that bring in five, 6,000 people will start to consider Kansas City, then it makes a difference. Kansas City is ideally placed in terms of where it is in the country. It's always just been held back by hotel space. As you well know, the Trump administration wants to cut taxes for individuals and corporations and cut way back on regulations governing businesses. If that comes to fruition, what will be the impact, do you think, on the economy? Most of the analysis indicates that if those tax reforms are carried out, we'll see better growth locally, we'll see better growth in the country as a whole, and even globally. World Bank, IMF, OECD have all been very enthusiastic about the discussion around tax reform. The trick is, what will it actually look like when it gets through Congress? When it comes to regulation, Again, a lot of enthusiasm about lowering regulation, but it's hard to do. Um, many of the regulations are set by law, and it's going to require going back to court to change them. Well, the incoming president has threatened tariffs in the event of unfair labor practices or what he might perceive to be unfair. Tariffs can be a difficult problem for the country, can they not? They can, and I think what was interesting is yesterday's testimony by Wilbur Ross gave a lot more... He's incoming commerce He's secretary. incoming commerce secretary, has given a lot more form to this conversation about imports, and his conversation focused on enforcing existing rules, not so much <laughs> imposing new tariffs, but just simply paying attention to what's already on the books and making other countries play by the same rules we play by. If Obamacare is ultimately replaced by by a more market-driven system, will that be great for the U.S. economy or have much of an impact? It will probably have an impact. The biggest issue when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, health care in general, we have still not dealt with why health care is so expensive in the U.S. We spend 25% of our GDP on health care, every other developed country closer to 10. 
regardless of how we decide to pay for it, we have to figure out why it's so expensive and how to make it cheaper. How about Wall Street in 2017? Got off to a pretty good start. It's going to continue. A lot of what's making the market so rich here right now is foreign money. Almost 25% of the money in our market is coming from Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, because investors there have no options locally. They have to come to the U.S. if they're going to get any kind of a return. That's made the dollar stronger. So a little bit of a good and bad. Final question. Any fears about an imminent recession of consequence? No, we're not looking at sort of a heart attack vision as far as the economy is concerned. What we are dealing with is an economy that has a chronic disease. It's just going to feel crappy for years. <laughs> Chris, great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. That is economist Chris Keel with Armada Corporate Intelligence. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. John Stevens heads Rock Hill Strategic. <coughs> Denidre Herbert is the managing editor of The Sentinel, a conservative news service in Kansas. Cynthia Wheeler is a marketing strategist, and Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome to all of you. It's great to see you. I know you're all eager to talk about Donald Trump. What? So <laughs> let's, let us begin. Nobody talks about It was no. a startling but welcome sight. The Kansas City Star's lead editorial on January the 14th, written by conservative columnist Dr. Charles Krauthammer. Krauthammer says Donald Trump has received the shortest honeymoon period for a new president in recent memory. The columnist cites a couple of reasons. First, the refusal of an unbending left to accept the legitimacy of a Trump victory. And Krauthammer also blames Trump for, and I quote, his own instincts and inclinations a thirst for attention that leads to hyperactivity. Well, it seems unlikely that Democrats and media critics are going to change their minds about Trump. It seems equally unlikely that Trump is going to change his style. So what should we expect? Smooth sailing or rough waters as we head into the next four years? And let us begin by asking Cynthia. You know, you did that on purpose, didn't you? <laughs> well, I thought she'd have another reaction. He's not, uh, Krothammer has not been a fan of Trump no. at all. Um, I've seen him on O'Reilly. But traditionally speaking, as you move forward in these, you know, pre-inaugural days, there's messaging and cohesiveness that you should be gathering together. And it would appear to me that Trump doesn't have the capacity to do that. He's still campaigning. Um, you had FDR with the New Deal, the Kennedys. You also had, I know we hate to talk about him, Barack Obama with the Yes, We Can. But the messaging needs to be there. My biggest concern with Trump is uh, lack of cohesive messaging and bringing in those who were not part of his original coalition and the tweeting. The tweeting is, is so braggadocious, bombastic, it's just childish. And he picks fights with individuals that, quite frankly, I sometimes wonder strategically if that's what he's planning, because he's distracted you from the bigger picture, like the 270 ambassadors who are coming mm -hmm. back, and we have no representation nationally. So I mean, there's would some I be big correct issues. in assuming that you don't think it's going to be smooth for the next I think it's going to be entertaining. <laughs> I think it's going to be bumpy. Um, but if he can get through the first 100 days, I think he has an opportunity well, to be same, in eight years. Let me ask the same question to Woody. Uh, rough waters or smooth sailing in the next four years? generally speaking. No, rough. And uh, don't blame Trump, though all his tweeting and everything contributes to it. The country's divided, drastically divided. The last president went into office saying, I'm going to transform America, not change it, trim around the edge. I'm going to transform the country and thereby transform the <coughs> world. Well, if you say that to a country that's reasonably prosperous and reasonably free, where a lot of people are happy with its fundamental values and everything, they're going to be, whoa, where, where's this coming from? The, uh, the, the people who want it transformed are going to march under your banner. We, look, we've been divided, badly divided, as badly as we have been in 100 years for quite a while now, and it just keeps getting worse. It's not somebody else's fault. It's us, the American people. We are divided. So, John, is there any justification for 60-plus members of the U.S. House, all Democrats, boycotting the inauguration on Friday? Well, that's that's their individual choice. I thank you. I agree. I, I, yeah, I, that that's their individual choice. They're trying to take a stand as to some of the bombastic things that Trump has said. Uh, they're trying to represent, I think, their constituents. Beyond that, would would I would would I uh, do that? No. 
But I do think that they're at least taking a stand and trying to create some level of bulwark against some of the more extreme things that Trump has said. Now, he hasn't well, well, really Not going to the inauguration doesn't change what Trump said or will say. No, but it has started a conversation, and it, it continues. Well, it, it is, is American. American. Why is it a conversation? Why is it a conversation? Because the conversation is Trump's mean, he's bad, he's evil. Actually, how, the how conversation useful? is no, pay time attention. Out. Time out. Mm -hmm. You have your say. The conversation is Trump's bad, Trump's no. evil, Trump's a no. bad guy, and it's well. also a bad uh, display. We are one of the greatest nations in the world. We've had a peaceful transition of power for since we began, and it's it still peaceful. Except just once. because no, but, just but because you know we're, these things we're grow. well, yeah, these just once. Grow. Yeah, I agree these, with you. But these it's things still grow. peaceful. And, and no, it's still peaceful. If I take a stand and decide to march, what, what, that what, I no, hate no, Trump. No, 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 no. What we're peaceful. supposed to be, what we're supposed to be showing, is a celebration yeah. of the transfer. Eight years ago, oh yes, no, we did. We made a point of having a press conference that said, "I'm going to do whatever I can to make this the worst." presidency possible, and that was the Republicans. So to sit here and say who, who people can't have sides right. and pick them is ridiculous. Who, who I didn't quoting? say people can't say, take sides. That's not what I said. Well, you are putting a word. Well, you put words no, in I didn't put words Look, in your mouth. I, I said We had a civil what, war because of what a guy just wrote a book about. He called it a disease in the public mind. We have a disease in the public mind in this country. Uh, there are people who believe that if you disagree with them, you are not mistaken. Correct. You are evil. <laughs> or dumb. And there are people like Correct. that on both sides. I agree. I, of Absolutely. course, am a conservative because I believe the left is intrinsically that way in this country today. Dumb you disagree evil. with us, you're evil. <laughs> I think All it right. works both ways, but I have to agree. I think we have a clear-cut difference of opinion. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kansas, City, we were divided. Kansas City, Missouri voters never have to wait very long before they can vote again. The next time is April the 4th, and two of the issues headed for the ballot involve tax increases. The bigger one is an $800 million bond package for infrastructure that would increase the property tax. The council has had some trouble deciding what to include, but whatever the decision, the package must be approved by 57.1% of the voters. And John, I have the feeling that's not going to be very easy to achieve. No, I, I don't think it'll be easy, but will it be achieved? Yes, and it's because it's necessary. You look at what the city has in deferred maintenance infrastructure. We have a billion dollars in street reconstruction needs, 400 million in road repairs, 590 million in sidewalk replacement, on and on and on. And that's not to say that over the last decade, 20 years, 30 years, there haven't been investments in that, but it has not been enough investment out of, out of the city funds to keep pace. So we're falling behind. We have to do something to catch up. But, but we're at the last minute. We're taping this on Thursday morning. Mm -hmm. As of yesterday, the council couldn't decide what to include, right. and they have to decide by today or it doesn't get on the April the 4th ballot. Isn't this a little late to be making a decision of that magnitude? The, the, 11th hour, the 11th hour urgency is ridiculous. That being said, there, there is no debate among the council uh, on what items should be included. It's how much commitment, what percentage of commitment for sidewalks versus roads should be in there. That's a healthy discussion. I wish it had happened six months ago, yeah, but it's a healthy where discussion. I was, no, well, I was what do you going, think, Cynthia? No, that's where I was going. I think it's a healthy discussion, and I do believe we have some infrastructure issues. My concern, though, is we have lots of budget cuts coming down, even from the uh, state level with a new governor. Yeah. So, you know, do I want to pay more taxes for greater infrastructure or do I not want to? And at some point, decisions need to be made. Yeah. Is Clinton's uh, plan better? Clinton's plan better than Mayor Sly Clinton James? Lucas, I mean, who, whose plan is better? Who cares? Yeah. Pick a plan. We're at two plans and give us now, an the Lucas yeah. plan exactly. and, and the give James us an opportunity. plan. They both mm -hmm. cost the yeah. same thing, but one emphasizes maybe sidewalks over right. roads and the other Actually, the Actually, it's about dogs and yeah. shelters. Uh, Woody, are you at all surprised? We've got to move along, but are you at all surprised we're at this point in the planning? Well, no. Look, the, the word we heard was deferred maintenance. The real word for that is mismanagement. And what you're looking at when you have deferred maintenance is decades of mismanagement. You should never defer maintenance. When you do it for decades, you get to the point where you say, we have 1.2 billion or whatever in deferred maintenance. We have a badly mismanaged city that is terribly in debt already, and so now we're going to go in debt more because we didn't pay for what we should have paid for every year. In essence, they didn't take the tax dollars and keep the streets smooth That's and right. the roads That wonderful earnings tax what somehow didn't fix things. have been used for something else, and now but people, people say, well, 
Well, it's because of deferred maintenance, as Woody points out. We need more money yes. because this maintenance can't be deferred any longer. But do we have to kick the can down? Should we kick the can down the road another decade? No, we should bite the bullet, do it, move if forward. You show me systemic, it. If you show me a systemic change exactly. so that we don't defer it ever again, I'll vote for your tax. <laughs> if you're not going to do that, we're going to dig right. this hole and why we'll be back at the same place money? 10 or 20 years why from trust now. Them that's, with why, money? that's why I believe that we are setting on, on this idea of let's clearly define exactly where this $800 million dollars is being spent. Well, that's you've heard what challenge. he's saying. If where's you the, get this worked out, well, where's well, the regular you, budget You get this spent. worked out. Right. Yeah. Right. You but get this, get this worked out. Woody will move to Kansas City, Missouri, and vote for you. Also on the ballot, also on the ballot, a ten-year, one-eighth of a cent sales tax to promote economic development, but only in the area bounded by 9th Street and Gregory, and by the Paseo in Indiana. Well, why just that area, John? Well, that's an area, those are neighborhoods that have clearly been neglected, both public, private sector, on and on and on for decades. That being said, I don't think that a, a regressive sales tax, one eight cent sales tax that is not very clearly defined as to how that estimated $8 million a year is going to be spent, that's not the approach to solving the problems in those neighborhoods. There should be a different approach and different investments. But I think this, this petition initiative, like many, have come out of frustration and lack of investment, and people are frustrated and they want to see but, change. But that's a pretty broad term, isn't it? Economic development. Do we know what exactly will happen with <laughs> that? that? No, 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 that's, that's my point. Maybe nothing, fund. right? No, it's that's my point. It's that's a slush fund. Uh, Nidri, this is yeah. just for a certain geographic area, and yes, right. we understand that was done by citizens who put together a petition, but right. is it fair? No, it's not fair, and, and when, since it isn't defined, it will end up in my opinion, historically, as a sort of slush fund. It'll be given to theater groups, and economic development means everything and anything. It'll be given to uh, community theater groups, which I'm not knocking, but if I vote for that tax, is that what I think it's going to? I mean, I, I, think, Cynthia, I wouldn't vote for it. No, but I think that's a challenge for both so do, the issues. Do you, think it's fair? do you think it's fair to no. take that one-eighth of a cent sales tax and use it only for a certain geographic area? Uh, well, we did that for the Sprint Center, didn't we? We did a bond or a tax for the Sprint Center. My point is this. And both have messaging issues. If you're talking to me about what I know, you cannot get people excited without specifics, as Woody yep. said, and details. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to vote for something Agreed. if I think you're going to mess up the slush fund. And I'm not going to vote for something if I think it is just for two people in the neighborhood. That's right. the city's challenge. But okay, i got to go here because <laughs> this will not be the last of what we talk about regarding infrastructure. I have learned and want to tell you that for the next three months, KCPT and its digital magazine, Flatland, are focusing on the issue of infrastructure in the Kansas City area. For more coverage, just look to Ruckus, Kansas City Week in Review, and at flatlandkc.org. Okay, whether you like Kansas Governor Sam Brownback or not, support him or not, it's easy to understand that he's tired of being criticized, fairly or not. The second term governor is taking heat for his recently released budget package. Clearly, legislators who ran on opposing Brownback, many in his own party, don't like what he outlines. So Brownback's response is this, come up with your own budget. <laughs> You've been watching Kansas government and Brownback and early. writing about all that. How do you see this budget battle being worked out or will it be worked out? And let's start over here with Denidri. Brownback's uh, part of his proposal is to use the unclaimed property fund, which is actually the pooled money investment board money. But it's it's a fund that has $365 million in it, and our budget hole, or our, I hate to call budget hole because it's really a difference between proposed spending and... Structural imbalance. Yeah. I'm not calling it that either. <laughs> anyway, there's $365 million there that's not being used now, or anything. Let, let me but interrupt you for just a second. This would be like a person's 401k or, yeah. mm -hmm. or IRA yeah. or savings accounts. Yes. Like so if that were in your house and you had a roof you needed to... To, to build and you didn't have any money, you would go to that fund to take money out of it and pay yourself back. That's what he's proposed. The other challenge, and so that's what's going to happen. Nobody likes it, but the challenge is in the House you have 125 members, 24 are what I would call solid conservatives, maybe 32 depending on what goes through there. You have um, 40 Democrats, 61 soft Republicans. The 61 soft Republicans have to get two people on board. I don't think the Democrats are going to vote for anything. They're, they have shown their hand on that. They uh, selected Jim Ward as their um, 
majority leader or minority leader. They and he has said no. I'm not going to vote to repeal the LLC exemption unless we have a full package. Their their hand is we're voting no on everything. You got to get 63 votes. That is the only thing that doesn't raise taxes or cut spending. Well, let me follow up on that That's, for just a moment with yes. you. So if, if the legislature does that, yes, and that takes care of the budget shall we call it deficit, whatever you want to call it, right. lack of money, shortage, uh, takes care of it for this fiscal year. But then what about the next fiscal year and the one after that and well, the one after that? I sure hope, which isn't going to happen, my unicorn is that they start, they get, in <laughs> That's there, a good one. they get in there and start making cuts. But realistically, they are going to raise taxes. I'm not a fan of Brownback's plan, which is to raise cigarette taxes, some sin taxes. I think that's a a dream of Missourians everywhere, Missouri convenience store owners. And the other plan that I've heard, which is an abomination, is includes things like increasing the gasoline tax 11 cents per gallon, which another lovely gift to the Missouri convenience store owners. Uh, it's so taxes are going to be raised, no cuts will be made, and we will all be much poorer. But the LLC exemption, is that going to be overridden, done away with? Uh, they, people tell me that they have the votes to get rid of it. Okay. It has to. Uh, John, some critics, and some of them I think are Republicans, say that Brownback is just looking at this unrealistically. Well, is he, do you think? Yes, no, I, I think he has. but. Now, where, where we stand right now in this next session, facing the imbalance this year, the rest of this year and next year, he really has laid out, there, there are zero to no options in closing this in the next 18 months, other than what DeAndre laid out, which is, and also the state investment for portfolio, and also continuing to pull from CAPERS and continuing to pull from uh, KDOT. That is the reality. Now, the back end of that, I don't know that there's much trust in Governor Brownback among anybody in the legislature uh, to help lead a solution that's a long-term fix. And I hope that they're able to do that. I think it starts with the LLC repeal, but beyond that, uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a battle. Let me throw this out and maybe somebody can answer it for me. In addition to all these issues, there is a school finance decision, uh, I gather, about to be handed down by the state Supreme Court. And most people who pay attention to all that say it's going to probably be a decision against the legislature and the governor and call for maybe as much as $500 million more a year. So, Woody, what happens then? Well, you, you wanted a long-range plan for the budgeting in Kansas. I'll give you one. Put something on the uh, uh, ballot that sets a minimum, as Missouri has, that must be spent on public education, percentage of GR. In Missouri, that's 25 percent. Is that K-12? Uh, yeah, Not it's K-12. K-12 right. gets at least 25 percent. Now, the fact is they generally get 30. But as long as they go over 25, it's no business of the courts yeah, what's being spent. And, and you need to get the courts out of this. And in yes. Kansas, nobody knows what the... the Constitution right. really means by right. how they're arguing they, over a yeah. word that's not yeah. even in it. What, what is the, <laughs> what, what, appropriate or uh, uh, adequate? adequate. adequate. Yeah. adequate. What is adequate financing? Now we head over to the soapbox for roast and toast, where the Ruckheads have 30 seconds each to acclaim or defame people and events in the news. And we start with John. Sure. My roast is for Senator, Senator Missouri Senator Emery of Lamar, Missouri, for proposing Senate Bill 98, which is yet another uh, so-called bathroom bill, similar to North Carolina and others. Missouri is in a position of cutting budgets, looking at a lot of things and a lot of issues that are real and meaningful to the citizens. What Senator Emery is doing is only creating more divide, more divisiveness. Um, it is a solution in search of a problem and should absolutely be killed and never see the light of day on the uh, House floor. Woody. Uh, my roast is for my good friend Steve Rose, who thinks that it's awful that the citizens for responsible government oppose absolutely every idea the mayor comes up with to borrow and spend money. But for some reason, it's sensible for him to support every one of them. <laughs> uh, it, it, there's an inconsistency there, Steve. The folks over at, at Citizens for Responsible Government are doing what this city has not done in decades, which is try to figure out how you do, you know, keep the city growing without going broke with debt. The Deidre. 
My roast this week is for the Kansas City area weather uh, people <laughs> who managed to make me uh, Charlie Brown to Lucy's football. I waited all weekend for a storm that never happened, canceled all my plans. By Saturday afternoon, without a drop of ice on the ground on the southwest side, I was wandering around the grocery store, which was the only thing open. I did find that they have rice cauliflower. I appreciate that. Kansas City weather people, I hope my roast keeps you warm the next time we don't have a storm that you overhype. <laughs> All right, and Cynthia. Uh, my roast is to journalists, and many of my journalist friends will not appreciate this. Um, I think journalists are supposed to provide us the words that were spoken and not opinionate like those of us who pontificate on what needs to change. <laughs> and in not doing so, they've gotten caught up in the tweeting and the personal and they have allowed us as a society to be distracted and forget about the value of media and what it brings to us in terms of messaging and politics. All right, and finally, here is a roast to Rosie O'Donnell, who has called for martial law to delay the presidential inauguration until <laughs> Donald Trump is cleared of the charges against him. Of course, there are no charges against him, <laughs> only allegations. Rosie O'Donnell is said to be a professional comedian, but she's at her funniest when she attempts to be serious. <laughs> and that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. Production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you.